Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the final session of the Haas Symposium for today. I am here sharing this final questions and answers session with our speakers from today. So welcoming back Dr. Simon Nathan, Dr. Rosie Crane, Julia Bradshaw, and Dr. Paul Schofield. Thank you to everyone who has submitted questions. We will do our best to answer these in the next hour. I'm going to begin, first of all, by acknowledging the communications we've received from Haast descendants um, who have responded to Simon's um, call. Um, we're thrilled to have had contact now uh, with people from descendants in Christchurch and New South Wales. And also, we're very thrilled to have um, Dr. von Susani from Geneva uh, writing in as a direct descendant of Ferdinand von Hochstetter. We're so thrilled that you're able to join us from Geneva today, Dr. von Susani, on Hochstetter's birthday. This is absolutely wonderful. So, moving on to our questions. Simon, first question is for you. Uh, Paul Starr from Dunedin writes, thanks Simon for your gallery of Haast photos. Would it be possible to put up again the group photo of the Canterbury Exhibition Committee members and give us your best guesses on who the other people in the photograph are? Oh, um, it'll just take me a moment to find it. Um, sorry, I put that down. So I'll just get the... this, this is a really good question because some of the um, some of the members, some of the subjects in that photograph are named in the archival finding yeah. aid, but not all of them. So I think there might be room for further research. It would be interesting yeah. to see how many of those you have been able to identify, Simon. Well, Paul may well know some more as well. Yes. From his researches that he's been doing on people like John Ennis and a general, you know, environmental history type things. The thing that I note was that the copy in the Alexander Turnbull Library and the copy held in the Canterbury Museum are both cropped very differently. So we ah. have quite a, different, quite a different cropping, but right. the people are the same. So the, the information on the subjects once identified will be valuable to both finding aids at Canterbury Museum as well as our own here at the Turnbull Library. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just having... Um... A little, I'm just trying to load it on the, uh, on the system. Perhaps if you, you could go on to another question and come back to that. I mean, I've got the photo here. I just um, no haven't problem. managed to load it on Zo Zoom. We'll, we'll come back to that one, Simon. If you're happy, I'll ask you the next question while it's loading. This one is from Professor Dr. Marianne Clemoun in Vienna, who's asking, it's about Haast's beard. Darwin decided to wear a beard as he seemed to be impressed by Moses's beard. <laughs> Are there any thoughts about Haast's decision? Simon. Well, Haast was always bearded in all the photographs we've got. So I don't, I, I'm not sure it was a conscious decision. I mean, it, presumably he was bearded when he came from, uh, came from Germany. So I, uh, whether it had any connection with Darwin or not, I don't know. But um, it's interesting, his beard, he always had a bushy beard right from the very first photograph we have of him. So more likely to be a fashion of the day. I think so, yes. It's and interesting that it's not trimmed at all, is it? It's a completely full beard. I mean, a lot of people like Joseph Dalton Hooker had one, and, and even Thomas Henry Huxley, had one of those ones that sort of uh, go down here and they trimmed the face and they just had neck beard and a little bit sideburns. But mm. his is a full one and yeah. a full moustache. It was a very luxurious moustache. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we've, we've certainly noticed the difference in his trimming by comparing the, uh, the portraits of Hast and trying to date them, deciding in which, which barber he was using at the time. So, yeah. you, I think that for... Me, sorry, Julia. I think that for an explorer, a, um, a beard would be very, very practical as well. That's something else to think about. Uh, 
Thank you, Simon. Yeah. We now have the portrait, group portrait, back up on screen. Yes. Would you like to give us some of your best guesses at whom these, who these people are? Um, yes, I'm sorry. I, I um, there are diff people have labelled some of them differently. This this is Haas. We assume this is Haas here sitting down. Uh, this is uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Maskell, who was later registrar of the University of New Zealand. Um, this is the photographer over here. Um, and there's some doubt as to the, the second from the left. It is, um, I've seen two different identifications. One of them is Sahitan Rhodes, uh, and the other is the Mayor of Christchurch. Uh, and, and I would love to get that clarified. I'm not sure about the third person, but this is the fourth from the left is James Hector. Um, and over... Um, can I, I'm sorry, I'm having a mental slip up now. Um, oh, this is to, uh, the shorter man here in the centre is Thomas Potts. Now, I wonder if Paul or anyone else or anyone else can add any, anything to that, those identifications. No, the, the Potts. Uh, if you do have any suggestions, it would be great to email them in uh, because I would like. Uh, this is, I'm hoping to put this in the published version, and it would be nice to have the the best up to date guess uh, uh, that we could have uh, who, who the people were, because this is one photo. I suspect it probably was not labelled by Dr. Barker because he died fairly short shortly after he took it, and so I think the labelling has been sub has been later, and that's why there has been a bit of doubt as to who the individuals are. Yeah, I can I can second that. It'd be really valuable to be able to add names to these faces. So we see what sort of input we get. Yeah. Thank you. Moving on to our next question, again for Simon. This one is from Katie Pickles in Christchurch. Can you say more about how, if based on your research, you can read Haas personality from the photographs of him? You mentioned beard and stature, anything of his mind. Well, I've, I saw this photo come in and I've been back and looked at the photos um, and it also inspired me to go and look at the photos I have of James Hector. And I came to the conclusion that no, I really don't think I could read any personality in the photographs. In the, in the 19th century, when photographs were take, being taken, um, people usually looked pretty neutral. And I think part of that was because you had to stay very still for the photograph. Uh, they were often time exposures of up to five seconds. Um, you see very few photographs of people people smiling. And so I'm, I'm sorry, but I really don't think I can read into an, anything of past expressions. Uh, they all are looking quite neutral. Thank you, that's wonderful. I, th I think there, there is probably a matter of combining different sources. So we have to combine his sort of inscriptions, his dedications. Yes. Um, the co covering letters that some of these portraits were sent with, mm. and I think then we get a pretty good understanding yes. of past the man himself. Thank you, Simon. That was wonderful. I'm now going to turn to Rosie. Rosie, <laughs> welcome. Hast and Hutton, in some respects, seem to have had larger-than-life personalities. Was there something about museums in those early days that attracted people like that? Um, I don't know that that was necessarily museums. I think you'll find that most of the men of science of the 19th century, there were very few in New Zealand, um, but most of the ones who thought of themselves and who published as scientists had a good, strong voice um, in terms of their expertise. They were not shy about claiming all sorts of things, whether it whether it was pertinent to their research or not, some of them are uh, far more speculative, but um, they, they were not shy. Um, Hutton, Haast, Hector, um, well, those are the H-men, obviously, but then a whole bunch of others. We've just seen um, William, um, Maskell there in that photograph. I mean, he was another one who was not shy about writing things. And sometimes they were had their arms twisted to write for the um, annual transactions of the New Zealand Institute, which um, Hector edited and would, um, Simon will know more, but would 
some of the proceedings in the in the actual individual um, local institutes were not recorded. Um, but the 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 he was keen. Hector was keen to show that that New Zealand could hold its head up as a place to do science. But really, there weren't that many people. So yes, they had a voice. Uh, whether they were attracted to museums it was one of the few occupations where you could actually be employed. The other one was in the universities, and both Hutton and Parker, his successor, had dual jobs. They, they both ran the museum and they lectured in the university. So, so almost we would say one of the few opportunities to be a professional scientist in New yes. Zealand at the time, really. Thank you, Rosie, that's great. We have another question for you from Dr. Morgan Merien from Christchurch. Do you think the competition between Haast and Hutton helped or hindered the quality of the collections of the respective museums? I think in general, it probably enhanced. I mean, Hutton said uh, if there hadn't been a Christchurch museum, there wouldn't have been a Dunedin one. And time and again, he's saying, you know, um, basically, you know, thank you, old Haast, you know, my chum in Christchurch. You're doing good because we can lever off you, leverage off you. As to the actual collections, um, yes, the, yes and no. I mean, Otago people, museum people never really went out collecting specifically for the, the collections they, um, until in the 50s when uh, Ray Forster came along with his interest, deep interest in spiders. We have a lot of spiders in the collections, but otherwise uh, the early collections are opportunistic and, and by happenstance and dealing what you could get. Um, and it didn't necessarily uh, help, um, it, you know, the, what you could get in terms of birds and mammals and so on, the showy things enable people to come in and spend their wet Sunday afternoons in the museum and, and be entertained and have rational, edu uh, rational entertainment, which was the rage in Victorian society. There weren't many other places to do that, certainly in Dunedin. Um, and um, I've lost my train of thought now because I've leathered on. Sorry. I'm not sure if that's answered the question. No, that, that's great. Thanks, Rosie. I think I think one of the other ways that early collections were acquired were really these were byproducts of field research, weren't they? Really, I mean, th these were the field surveys. There were the field research being done by scientists, and the, the museum collections was really those. That, certainly, that applies it, to to the um, geological survey and the rocks that we've got. The he Hector's initial survey of Otago, we've got those. Um, Rocks, or if we don't have them, the university has them because there was a, a kind of when in the 1950s the museum split administratively from the university, the university claimed what they had and we claimed what we had. So possession was nine points of the law, regardless of who had actually paid for them in the first place. And who had paid for them was all kind of complicated with, um, with a, a fiscal triangle of of both the Institute, the Otago Institute, the museum per se, and the university. So who paid for what in the early days is shadowed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much, Rosie, that's great. Um, my next question um, is for Paul. At the University in Bonn, Germany, one of the first paleontological museums were founded in 1848 by Georg August Goldfuss, uh, born in 1782, died 1848. Was this background important for Haas's development as a naturalist? Mm -hmm. This question does come from uh, Professor Dr. Marianne Klimun in Vienna. The next question for Paul is also from Professor Dr. Marianne Klimun in Vienna, asking, Hallstatt was the main region of Franz Hauer's as director of the survey in Vienna, geological survey. He started with collecting and describing the fossils in 1849. So Hochstetter was learned from Hauer's publication and collection. This is in reference to the exchange of specimens. Um, another question for Paul. Paul, you're going to be busy. 
once we have you back on, um, from Vaughan Wood. Did the geological text cited by von Haast in his exploratory phase evolve over time? And do they reveal anything about geological education? And another question for Paul. Were the early opinions of New Zealand by Ernst Diefenbach ever drawn upon? This question is also from Dr. Vaughan Wood. Now I'm going to um, read to you a message that we received from Margaret Fido. Um, and this is in relation to um, Simon's talk. Uh, Margaret writes, thank you for this opportunity to learn more about Sir Julius. I lived in Auckland and I'm not so mobile these days, so this opportunity is particularly valuable. We're pleased you were able to join us, Margaret. I used to cycle into the public library on a Sunday in 1956 to 1957 when I was 14 and at Avonside Girls to read in the reference room where I discovered the life and times of Julius von Haast and now I have my own copy. Imagine my excitement when I found evidence that he had visited the Pakihi on page 413, which was the valley where I then lived at what is now Inchbonny. My brother still lives there. Margaret writes further, Simon, I'm curious to know whether anyone has had any interest in this particular part of Haas' adventures and what publications, specimens there might be. I'm an amateur and multidisciplinary lifelong learner with wide interests, so any fields, field is of interest to me. I am enjoying seeing the global links that were being made as a result of these early pioneering people. Thank you again, Fido, uh, Mrs. Fido. Much appreciated. Um, Simon, would you like to respond to that? Well, yes, I can't respond very positively, I'm afraid. Um, I must admit, until I saw the question, I never realised that, that Haast had actually been to Inchbonny. Um, it's interesting that he is remembered particularly for his Canterbury explorations, but in fact, he did have a ma major expedition along the West Coast and uh, at the time that gold was discovered uh, and his observation, he, like everything, he recorded very painstakingly. So his observations are very, very valuable. But now I'm sorry, I, I don't know anything about his visit to, to um, Inchbonny. And that seems to be another illustration of how detailed uh, the biography is. Heinrich has put in every detail. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, shall we come back to Paul, who has just joined us? We're pleased to be able to see you, Paul. Um, would you like me to read out your questions again, or are you just happy to start responding to those that you have in front of you? Yeah, sure. The 1840s, uh, the 1840s, sorry, in um, in Belgium, and then he moved back to um, Frankfurt um, in the early um, in the early uh, 1850s. Um, is, is that your understanding, Sasha? Uh, yes, that would be. Yeah. So um, with that background, that would probably mean that um, he didn't actually um, have any involvement in the Bonn um, Paleontological Museum um, that was established in 1848. Um, it would appear that if he did go to the University of Bonn, um, he would have actually probably been being taught by um, Nogarath, who was the, um, the professor there at the time that he was actually... Um, uh, in, at Bonn, and Nogarath, his um, specialities were mineralogy and mine engineering. Um, so his geological background, um, if it had any formal geological background, would have been from 
um, in, in probably more in mineralogy and, and even some of the text in um, Heinrich's book suggests that he, he actually was f um, far more interested in mineralogy perhaps even as a merchant in, in mineralogical specimens. Um, so um, I think that answers the first of um, Professor Cleum's uh, questions. Um, the second was about uh, Hallstatt and um, Franz Hauer. And although we don't have any specimens specifically from Franz Hauer um, that we can identify in the collection, um, as essentially um, Hochstetter's boss, um, the in interest in the um, Hallstatt region um, would have been you know, very top of mind in Hochstetter's um, learnings. Um, he probably um, had uh, access to the uh, you know, the entirety of the Hallstatt collections, um, and um, it's my uh, observation, although this isn't proven, that he could well have just been able to go through the collections as a whole and sort of cherry pick from them to to get a a representative collection that he could then send to Haast. Um, and for that reason, I believe that um, you know there are several, maybe as many as four different collections uh, or collectors um, labelled um, from the Haustata collections. And, um, and that's why I consider that they're actually very significant. Um, a, a, a question from Vaughan Ward, which um, came through, was about um, the geological texts that, um, cited by Vaughan Haas and his exploratory phases. Of, um, did they um, evolve over time and reflect anything about his geological education? And th that's very difficult to tease out because, of course, this was the, probably the most formative moments in um, geological the creation of um, geological ideas, and you know, literally, ideas were changing on a on a year by year basis. Um, the um, the most significant things that uh, we have noticed are in um, his various papers are the uses of different terms over time. Um, he was using um, the uh, the German term Jura. Um, in one of his very earliest um, publications. Um, but by um, the um, mid-1860s, he was, he was more commonly using the, the terms, you know, Jurassic and Triassic, um, which were uh, more uh, in vogue with the um, English um, geological um, zeitgeist of the time. Um, and a, f a, f a second question from um, Dr. Vaughan Wood um, was about um, Ernst, the um, importance of Ernst Diefenbach in, um, in the work of Haast and uh, Hofstede. Um, and we know, I believe, from uh, an early account that um, Hofstede had um, the German version of Ernst Diefenbach's uh, New Zealand um, with him um, during his travels through the North Island of New Zealand. And so they would have been very important um, in, in his understanding of, um, of the, you know, the New Zealand um, ge geology and natural history. Thank you, Paul. That's wonderful. It was, in fact, the English edition of Aunt Stephen Bass Travels in New Zealand. Um, there was no German edition. Um, at the time. But thank you so much. This is fantastic. So moving on to some more questions. Uh, we have another question for Julia, please. This is from Katie Pickles in Christchurch, who asks, in general, do you think that Haast carried favour and advanced his own interests more or less than other contemporaries? Yeah, well, that's a really interesting question. And I think um, other panellists will probably have an idea about that too. Um, certainly my impression from um, reading Haas's reports is and seeing the names, as, as Simon alluded to, um, his names are very focused on British scientists and prominent Cantabrians. I think that this was 
you know, very deliberate. And also Haast made sure that people knew that he had he had done this as well, um, or maybe even promised that he would do it. I don't know. Um, and as Rosie has pointed out, he certainly wasn't shy of claiming, um, you know, he's, he's, he was very good at big noting himself. Um, and I think, as I've mentioned, he had to be because he needed to secure his career. Uh, and he, you know, there may have been a bit of, he, he wasn't from England. He, he really did need to cement himself. What's quite interesting is that Haast very rarely mentions his companions on the, the expeditions that he did. Um, I only really, it does a little bit of detector work. Heinrich does mention their names, but he doesn't, Haas never said anything about them. So it's fortunate that some of Haas' companions actually wrote about the journey. So we do know a little bit more. What's interesting is that Young, for example, who was the youngest member of the Haas trip down the Awarua River, later wrote that he led all the way down the river and sorted out the route. But, of course, you, you don't get that impression from anything that Haast ever wrote. Um, I guess Young was kind of paid off by the fact he got a, a range named after him and a river and what have you. And I think yeah, Haast was doing that kind of thing, uh, making sure that the fact that he was taking all of the credit, um, yeah, people got some sort of compensation for that. That's that's my thought. Um, Thank you yeah, very so much. Hopefully that, yeah. That's great. Yeah, and no, I think we we see these themes coming through today of com competition, healthy competition, and how motivating that can be when we've got different mm -hmm. different players in different regions. That we've got the provinces, we've got different museum directors. So there's a there was a lot of competition, um, mm -hmm. and Haas was right in there in the mix. Thank you very much. Could I just throw in a comment about yes, Haas Snowman? This was inspired by Pasco's comment, and I went back and looked through the names, and I'm impressed, well, I, particularly on his first trip when he was in Nelson, almost all the names are names of British scientists, yeah. which I think is un surprising, but I think past at that stage had decided that he was going to stay in New Zealand and that he wanted to become British. And he took it full, I mean, he named the places like uh, Murchison and Mount Owen and Buckland Peaks, um, and he always he took care to write to the people. Oh, and of course, there's the Hooker Glacier. He wrote to Sir William Glass, uh, Sir William Hooker, and said that he was trying to set up a pantheon or Valhalla of scientific names, which was a very imaginative idea. But it also was of great advantage to him. And he also did that with Can well known Canterbury settlers. I mean, he made sure that the superintendents and his bosses were always had things named after him. Yeah, that's that's a really really good point. And I, th I think there was to some extent, um, you know, place names by order. I think nowadays we can sort of pay to have a star or a planet or something yeah. up there in, in the outer space named after us, yeah. um, or that's own a bit of Mars. Yeah. Um, I think back in those days, Hochstetter was certainly writing his letters that it would be a good idea to name something after the commander of the Navarra expedition, yes. and after other you know Austrian scientists because it would certainly to use that word in the question, carry favour, um, you know, and, and some of those names were just too difficult and haven't survived on the map. We do have Navarra, of course, is in the Southern Alps near Mount Cook, um, or it was until quite recently, um, whereas Villersdorf, Urbea, uh, was a much more difficult name, and I don't think that survived. Um, that was the commander of the Navarra expedition, of course. So place names by mail order, perhaps, um, mm -hmm. To some extent, yes, um, but basically, yes, he was trying to just commemorate um, those um, who had come before um, and whose footsteps he was trying to follow as a scientist and search for truth and science, uh, but also just to commemorate those contemporaries um, whom he respected and admired. Well, Rosie. When he came to swapping specimens, he, he deliberately went to Paris to swap with um, the Paris authorities rather than with Owen, who was being difficult. So he was quite happy to thumb his nose up at the biggest British institution. 
lots and lots of difficult personalities and so Richard <laughs> Owen was probably one of them <laughs> the egos of science we might say and that's another theme that's come through it takes a considerable ego to lead a museum and you know that foundation period the challenges thank you so much I'm moving on to the next question this one is for Rosie can you say a little more about the importance or not of the deck of the facades or architectural styles of the Canterbury Museum and Otago Museum? Was there a relationship between the facade and context? This is from Katie Pickles in Christchurch. Thank you, Katie. Well, how long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> because. <laughs> Comparative art history. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so um, the Otago Museum was designed um, by competition. And the one that won was uh, David Ross. Now, he had been, he was a well-known architect and had come over from Australia and he'd done lots of churches and vernacular architecture around here, um, which some of which survives. So his idea of a museum had the um, columns at the front, the three or four columns uh, for the porchway which was common for museums across the world. And they can nearly always be um, traced back to their origins of um, Robert Smike, Smirk, sorry, Smike Smirk, the architect for the British Museum in London, which was built in the 1820s, which was probably the first. And um, that was a deliberate homage to the Pantheon and other Greek temples. So you have the Greek columns. Okay, so that's on the one hand. On the other hand, you have um, Gothic edifices of which Canterbury Museum is one. And of course, the Targa University is neo-Gothic with its um, big clock tower and its steep angled roofs. Now in time honored fashion, the Natural History Museum in London also uh, ran a competition to find an architect. And there were several um, prize winners, uh, several contenders of whom this one here is the, is the winning um, design by Alfred Waterhouse. So that's pretty neo-Gothic and it's got a lot of terracotta um, decorations on the front, which you can't see on this picture here. Um, but inside, most museums had the same kind of thing. And that was uh, galleries. You know, I, I tell you, I, you know, there's how long have you got? Because here's a classic book by Carla Yani. It's now out of print, sadly, and it'll cost you an arm and a leg um, second hand. But this is a, a, an architectural expose of the design of museums, natural history museums, um, and the contents. And um, most of the natural history museums um, have, have a glass roof with galleries surrounding. And that comes very influenced by the um, 1851 um, Great Exhibition, which of course was Joseph Paxton and the glass, um, glass house, the glass museum. And an awful lot of the museums around the world have those. Um, and inside um, Edinburgh Museum, the Royal Scottish Ed uh, Museum in Edinburgh has, I think three floors and an open atrium to its roof. The Otago Museum had an open atrium. It's now boxed in to its roof, but its roof was um, made out of wood. Um, rather than um, glass and steel, uh, sorry, not steel, um, cast iron. But you can see when you're up there in the animal attic that it is still very church-like. When I take, um, you know, university students around the museum, I say, what does this remind you of? And they eventually come out with, oh, a church. Okay. Yes, it's a cathedral, a cathedral to science. And that's what they were all doing, um, and um, the the best instance actually is probably this one on the front cover of this book, uh, which is the um, 
Oxford University Museum, which was built in 1860. Again, another competition winner. That's great. Thank you so that much. Answer the question. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Yeah, no, I, th I think the, the, the monumental um, nature of museum buildings is really significant. And I think this is great that we can see that um, even in these early pioneering colonial periods. It's a monument to, to science, literature and the arts, which was, yeah. of course, the whole raison d'etre of the, um, the various institutes, the New Zealand Institute. That's what it was there for. That's great. Thanks, Rosie. I've got a few more questions. I think one each for our other speakers. So I've got one more for Simon, one for Paul, and one for Julia. Uh, I'm going to start with Simon. We have a question from Dr. Johannes Mattis of Vienna, who is joining us from India today. And he asks, Simon, could you please explain to what extent this huge biographical volume channeled and significantly shaped research on Haast in the long run, and perhaps still does today? Um, well, it is, it's the def definitive encyclopedia of Haast. Um, when Heinrich wrote it, he was the, the one, he was the first one that had access to the huge amount of, to the Haast papers. Uh, I mentioned that when, um, Julius died in 1877, uh, his, his widow Mary just packed up all his papers in a trunk. And a lot of those are the uh, their personal papers, but there are a lot of material there that I think these days uh, would, would should have been held by the museum authorities. So Heinrich had the best access to the best information that's available and there's very little that has come, come to hand since then. So that's why it is still the definitive biography. Um, it's interesting that um, the question was about how it shaped research. In fact, what, what it actually has done is um, it is so monumental that it has tended to stop future, uh, discourage future research. You know that if there's any information, you'll look it up. And, and the Heinrichs book actually has an excellent index. Um, there have been one or two theses since, and we've just, well, I think it's interesting that we have uh, transcribed some letter, trans, um, letter collections of Haast and his colleagues, but they don't actually mu add much to the overall story. Um, so I, I've got to say, I think more than anything else, Heinrich's book has acted as a discouragement uh, to, to people to do more research. It would be very hard to write another a modern biography that really wasn't a summary of what's already in, in Heinrich's book. Certainly a good example of a hard act to follow, Simon, yes. isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, now I've got one more question for, um, I think this is for Julia. Uh, this is from Jenny Abrahamson in Christchurch. Jenny writes, I'm sure that Haas knew that Māori had travelled over Haas to pass. When he said that no one had before him and his party, he would have meant no Europeans, people like him, with a more advanced civilization than that of Māori. He was a man of his time, and, he, and how would we have thought at that time without walking in his shoes? We can't judge, and the maps produced by those pioneering Europeans were amazing. I find it hard to understand how they did such a good job. Interesting. Thanks, Jenny. Um, yes, no, I, I, I mean, I agree. He certainly was a man of his time. Um, not everybody. I mean, the, a lot of Maori names were recorded because people did make an effort to record them. Uh, I think perhaps Haast was less um, diligent in that regard. And I think if you look at um, most of Haast's maps, there are very few Maori names on them. And of course, at the time, um, Europeans thought that they were much more advanced and more important and that they're not, that um, it was fine to supplant original names. Um, and I, I don't want to take away any of Haas achievements. It's just having sort of a, a new look at it with fresh eyes and thinking about how what happened in the 1860s has influenced what we see or what we see on maps today. So the landscape is 
is kind of to me anyway less interesting and and less knowledgeable in terms of the stories in the past than it could have been if some of those names had been retained. So I, you know, I'm a great supporter in keeping and having Maori names and European names together simply because it adds so much to the stories of, of the places. Thank you, Julia. I absolutely agree. It's great to have those dual place names that are being reinstated uh, by the New Zealand Geographic Board based on those submissions and the research that's going on. It's great to have those, those bicultural representations in our place names. Now, one final question, Paul. This one is from George Hook, who asks, Paul, are you able to comment on Haas' opinions on the evolution of Moa? We're looking forward to your lecture on this, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, it's, a, it's a huge, huge topic, I've, I've got to say. Um, can you hear me okay now? Yep. Yep. Okay, well, um, Haast, of course, although he definitely had a geological background, he didn't necessarily have a very strong um, zoological background. Um, and he was, there are actually um, in the letters that you transcribed um, actual expressions of <laughs> surprise that, um, that the European museums were so keen on moa and um, the, the, um, the skins of other birds and things. But he certainly, once he realised that it was a stepping stone for him to um, everlasting zoological glory, that he, he, he took the topic um, of moa evolution seriously. Um, he um, raised a whole lot of, of species he, he described a whole lot of species, about uh, 12, I believe. Um, only one of those names is um, in contention for being used today. Um, but um, at the time, you know, Hutton and um, even some of the European authorities were also ra rising, uh, describing unnecessary um, species as well, um, to the point that we actually at one one point there were at least 46 different names for MOA um, available. Um, using DNA and other techniques we now know that there were only um, nine species of MOA and that all the <coughs> variation that um, Haast, and Hook, uh, Haast and Hutton and others uh, were describing was probably due to um, glacial dwarfing and um, uh, the sexual dimorphism. And so, um, unfortunately, Haas started with a, with a poor data set and, and jumped into the subject a, a bit too much in the middle of, of, of the discussion. Um, but it, it's a very large subject to just critique his, his um, ideas about the evolution of Moa. Um, and perhaps that's a topic for another day. Thank you, Paul. And now I think that's all from me. Um, I'd like to invite Simon to say some closing words for today. Um, and then we welcome you back tomorrow. Simon. Well, thank you, Sasha. And thank you to all the other participants today. Um, I've been involved over the last 18 months with the, uh, the planning of the, the, the of the conference today. It's been amazing how things have evolved. Uh, originally, we were hoping to have a face-to-face -face conference in Christchurch uh, and perhaps with some overseas uh, participants. It's turned out that we're entirely online, but I think it has actually turned out very well because we're able to have probably a much broader uh, representation of people around New Zealand and from overseas. Uh, and I'd like to thank the people that are involved, have been involved in the organisation of it. Canterbury Museum has done a wonderful job and there's been a number of people behind the scenes getting it, getting everything going. So we're looking forward to starting again at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. But thank you to everyone that have, has, has contributed to this session. It's been a very stimulating and exciting meeting so far. Thank you.